Good morning, everybody. Yeah, happy Father's Day. And welcome to Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church. We are thankful to God, to all of our, our awesome dads that are with us today and part of our community. And we're also thankful for our awesome Heavenly Father. It, you know, watching over us and leading us and guiding us and directing us. We have the Voices of Peace leading us in worship today. It's, it's been awesome. And as we continue with our worship, just have some announcements to highlight. We got some anniversaries in the Peace Church family this week. Becky and Tom Thiel are celebrating their anniversary. Tuesday, Mark and Jeannie Axelrod have their 25th anniversary. And Bill and Mary... <laughs> Oh, thank you. And Bill and Mary Kay Lurkey are celebrating their anniversary. So happy anniversary. <laughs> Birthdays this week. Thomas Bruckner is five years old today. Mary Lenz has a birthday today. Also Austin Cullen, Mark Axelrod, Christopher Stecker, Sam Lenzmeyer, and Savannah Lenzmeyer. She turns three years old this week. So happy birthday. So, and we have some other announcements. Adult and teen volunteers are needed to assist at Vacation Bible School. We'll also be making decorations for VBS next Sunday at 10 a.m. You can also help by making some decorations at home. Contact Tara Bruckner if you're able to help at VBS or make decorations. Also, this Saturday, it's coming up fast. We got the electronic recycling event. Youth, we need you guys there. Even if you can only be there for like two hours out of the four, every little bit helps. And then the proceeds will go to the youth group. I think we can get as much as $480 for the youth group if we fill two semis full of recycling. And it sounds like we shouldn't have a problem because there's a lot of people that are looking forward to recycling stuff. So also we need adult helpers. That's this Saturday from 8 a.m. to 12 noon. And if you can do two hours, that's great. If you can do four hours, that's great. Every little bit helps. And then Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Gifts. Um, there's a list of items in the bulletin that we need. Also, Gospel Fest coming up August 19th and 20th. Although the band will be playing in our church the Sunday before on the 14th. Gospel Fest meeting is scheduled for Monday, June 27th, a week from the morrow, at 7 p.m. And this concludes our morning announcements. Let us pray. And Father, we thank you on this Father's Day, first and foremost for you. You are our awesome Heavenly Father, and we dedicate our whole service to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. you may have a fancy car, a brand new house that shines by far. You may live to be a hundred years old. But if you have not been saved, you lose it all with the grave. I want us to be It's not Mother's Day. Does anybody know what today is? That's right. It's Father's Day. And I wanted to show you a couple of pictures and what both of these people have in common. Does anyone know who this is by looking at the picture? Yes. That's right. Abraham. Does anyone know who Abraham Lincoln was? Does anyone know who Lincoln was? Yes. That's right. He was the 16th president of the United States. But you know what else he was? He was a father. And he loved his kids very much. And this is when my printer started running out of ink. But does anyone recognize who this man was? Yes. Wow, very good. You're right. This is George Washington. Does anybody know who George Washington was and what he was famous for? Yes, Abigail. That's right. He was the first president of the United States. He was the father of our country. But did you know this about George Washington? He didn't have kids of his own. 
when he, Martha, when he married Martha Washington, she had two kids from a previous marriage, and he loved those kids so much that he adopted them as his own. And did you know that's what God does for us? He loves us so much that when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he adopts us as his own into the family. All Christians are adopted by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 1, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. May the Lord add his blessing to our time in the word of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the scriptures. And I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be faithful to the scriptures in Jesus' name. Amen. A little girl was drawing a big picture for her dad down in the basement. She comes upstairs and she goes into his office while he's working and she crawls into his lap and says, Dad, come downstairs and look at the picture I'm working on. The dad said, not now, honey. Dad's busy. About 15 minutes later, she comes back again, goes in his office and crawls in his lap and says, Daddy, come down and see my picture. He said, not now, honey, Daddy's busy. I'll come by later. About three hours later, the dad came out of his office and he saw his daughter and he said, honey, did you, did you wanna show me something? And she said, yeah. And she took him downstairs and she showed him a big, beautiful picture of her and her mom and her brother and the family dog standing in front of the house, smiling on a sunny day. But the father noticed that he wasn't in the picture. And so he said, honey, it's a beautiful picture, but how come I'm not in the picture? And she said, because daddy, you're working in your office. Oh, and that made his heart sink. How many of you agree that it's good for both the mom and the dad to be in the picture? Yeah for both parents to give their children the love, support, and strength, and scriptural encouragement that they need every single day. That's one of the reasons why Solomon writes the book of Proverbs, because he wants to be in the picture. He wants to be the best father that he can be. And so, Today we're going to look at the first few chapters of Proverbs and talk about how you can stay in the picture and be the best parent that you can be. Solomon becomes the king of Israel in 1 Kings chapter 2. But he knew it would be a difficult job, so he asks God for wisdom and a discerning heart to lead the people and to know right from wrong. And God answers his prayer, and he becomes a very wise king. But unfortunately, he is wiser in his public life than he is in his personal life. And he makes a lot of sins. First Kings chapter 11 says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women, and he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And if you go to YouTube and you type in Solomon 700 wives, you'll come up with two or three videos right away discussing why God allowed Solomon to have 700 wives. But don't you think we ought to be asking instead, why is the smartest man in the world thinking it's a good idea to have 700 wives? <laughs> How many of you have your hands full with one wife? <laughs> I can't believe I'm asking that two days before my 25th anniversary. 
please forgive me. <laughs> but that's the situation that we have. How many of you agree that intelligent people do not always make intelligent choices, right? Isn't that true for Solomon? And another reason why he writes the book of Proverbs is to tell his kids, don't make the mistakes that I made. Honor your parents while they're still alive. Use money wisely. Be a lifelong learner. A gentle answer turns, a, turns away wrath. Watch how you speak. Think before you act. Fear God. Choose your friends wisely. Oh yeah, and one more thing. Don't marry 700 women. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Proverbs 1, verse 1. I, I like how in the very first few verses of Proverbs, he tells us what the book is for. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. What's the book for? For attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined life, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's what Solomon wants his kids to learn and to live. And then in verse 8, he says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. There's two things that we got to appreciate about that verse right off the bat. Number one, let's appreciate how the dad in Proverbs is putting himself in the picture. He's interacting with his kids. He's making time for his son. He's the, devoting an entire book of the Bible so that his son can be the best person he can be for God, unlike himself. Last year, I was invited to watch some of the little kids play t-ball in Hilbert. And I don't remember much about the games. I don't remember who hit the ball the farthest or anything like that. But you know what I do remember? Watching the young dads teaching their kids how to hold a bat, swing a bat, run the first base if they make contact with the ball, and know how to field the ball and where to throw the ball when they catch the ball. That made a bigger impression on me than whatever the score of the games might have been. I wanted to tell every one of those dads how awesome they are for taking time to be in the lives of their kids. It was an honor. I was telling Jeannie later, I'm sure it's like this all over Calumet County, but I was telling Jeannie, I'm honored to be in the Hilbert School District where we got so many dads crouching down in the dirt spending time with their kids in sports. And not all those kids are going to end up being the next Christian Yelich. I get that. But the fact that they're doing it is awesome. And I know you can't do it every waking moment. You have work. You have responsibilities. And sometimes I bet you come home from work so bone-tired and weary that all you want to do is plop down and melt in the couch and maybe drink a can of beer. I, I totally get that and I understand it. But when you make time to love and teach and play with your kids, you're making impressions of love that are going to last a lifetime. Even to this day, one of my clearest memories of, are of my dad taking me to Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati, Ohio to watch Pete Rose and Johnny Bench and Joe Morgan and the Big Red Machine play against the Montreal Expos. You know, they'll never forget stuff like that. It's totally worth doing it. Solomon wanted to make memories and impression on his kids that would last a lifetime. The second thing I appreciate about Proverbs 1 verse 8 is notice it's not just Solomon. Both the father and the mother are in the picture. Both parents 
are teaching, instructing, correcting, and training in righteousness. Well, what are they teaching? Well, that's what Proverbs chapters 1 through 31 get into. We only have time to dip a little bit into the first three chapters. But in Proverbs 1, they teach their kids to choose friends wisely. Proverbs 1, verses 10 through 15, My son, if sinners entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie and wait for someone's blood. Let's waylay some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and down to the pit. And then in verse 15, he says, my son, don't go along with them. Don't set foot on their paths, for their feet rush into sin. Don't just be friends with anybody. Choose your friends wisely. Choose your friends that are going to be a positive influence. Friends that care about their communities and families and respect authority. Julian Peterson has a recent book that he wrote about mass shootings. He says in almost every instance, the parents of the shooter were not in the picture. They were not monitoring the friendships and relationships of the perpetrator, and they weren't monitoring his mental health. Proverbs chapter 1 is a father exhorting his son to be careful about his relationships. And it's a challenge to all parents to be in the picture and say, you know what, I don't want you to be friends with just anybody. Choose your friends wisely. And maybe the parent should meet their child's friends and get to know them. And if they respect authority and they're kind and considerate, then they are good friends. Proverbs 13, verse 20 says, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Bad company corrupts good character. You can't control who your kids choose for friends when they get older, but when they're younger, you got to be in the picture monitoring those relationships. That's Proverbs 1. In Proverbs chapter 2, faithful parents teach their kids a biblical view of love and marriage and relationships. Proverbs chapter 2 starts out, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom. Verse 3, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding. Verse 5, you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And then he gets down to brass tacks and specifics in verse 16. Wisdom will save you from the adulteress from the wayward wife with her seductive words, who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant that she made before God. And, you know, Solomon committed adultery 999 times. It's difficult to not damage your relationship with God when you've committed adultery that many times. And so Solomon knows that this is a serious sin that can separate us from fellowship with the Lord. And so he expands on it throughout the book. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 7, he says in that particular verse, keep to a path. Far from the adulterous woman. Don't go near the door of her house. In Proverbs 5.27, can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can he walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So it is with the man who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. And when it's the right time in a child's life, faithful parents need to be teaching their kids what the scripture says about love and sexuality and relationships. There was a guy who got confirmed in our church before I got here, some years earlier. And years later, he went on a blind date. And I don't know if it was somebody he met on the internet or somebody that his friends introduced him to, but while he was on the date, the woman across the table from him said, 
I want you to know in the interests of full disclosure that I'm married, but my, I have my husband's permission to do this, and it's okay with him. I just want to make sure it's okay with you. And that young man got up from his seat and said, it's not okay with me, and he turned around and he walked out of the restaurant. All the wisdom that he learned in church, the wisdom that he learned from his mom and dad, it all came flooding back at that moment and helped him to make the right decision and get on out of there. And years later, he met a godly, wonderful, single Christian woman, and they got married, and they're happily married to this day. Jesus says in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. There is a blessing from heaven above for all who do what God says, even when it's difficult, even when it's tempting to do the opposite. And that's what we need to teach our children. Proverbs 19, verse 14 says, houses and wealth are inherited from parents, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Teach your sons that when they're old enough to date, they should date only single Christian women who love Jesus and respect their parents and are saving sex for marriage. And teach your daughters that when they are old enough to date, they should date only single Christian men who love Jesus and respect their parents and are saving sex for marriage. This sounds old-fashioned, doesn't it? That's because it doesn't get preached enough. And that's because it doesn't get practiced enough. People ignore the Word of God and lean on their own understanding rather than trying to understand what God has said in His Word. And yet it is the Bible that gives us the very definition of marriage. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 19, verses 4, 5, and 6. He says, haven't you read that at the beginning of creation, God made us male and female? And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. The Lord Jesus Christ is quoting from the book of Genesis. And in Jewish theology, if you wanted to bolster your point, you would go as far back toward the beginning of the Bible as you could for authority. And so Jesus goes all the way back to the second chapter of Genesis to drive home the point that the biblical definition of marriage is one man, one woman, one flesh, no exceptions whatsoever. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, says that those who commit immorality, premarital sex, homosexuality, idolatry, all those sins, if they continue in those sins without apology, without repenting before the Lord Jesus Christ, they are not going to heaven. It says that. It says, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Neither the, don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor thieves, nor homosexuals, nor slanders, nor swindler, swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. But yeah, that's bad news if you stop right there. But then it goes on to say, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So we also need to teach our kids that if we have sinned in any of these ways and fallen short of the glory of God, we can come to Christ for grace and forgiveness and be washed and sanctified and justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So there's good news even in in the midst of the bad news in that section. But faithful parents are not going to be neutral on issues of sexuality. Do you think mainstream media is neutral about sexuality? Do you think the, 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 the left is neutral about it? Absolutely not. And neither is Almighty God. We need to teach our kids what Scripture says. 
And notice that there's no gender confusion in the book of Proverbs. Solomon doesn't say, I'm sorry, my son. You wanted me to call you daughter. I'll call you daughter. He doesn't say, I'm sorry, my daughter. I'll call you son. Or I'll call you they because I don't want to offend you. There's nothing like that. There is no capitulation to crazy, leftist, atheistic, godless ideologies in the Word of God. Faithful parents affirm who their children are just as God created them. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. In Proverbs 1, faithful parents teach their kids to choose friends wisely. In chapter 2, they teach a biblical view of love and marriage and relationships. And in Proverbs 3, they teach their kids to trust God above all else. Proverbs 3, 1 through 4, we read that passage before, and then it climaxes in verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The Hebrew word for trust means to Commit yourself totally and to lean heavily on someone or something for support. I don't have a walker up here with me, but one time I was preaching this passage years ago at Chilton Village, and I borrowed a woman's walker, and I said, if I only lean on this walker lightly, there's a good chance I'm going to fall flat on my face. But if I commit myself to holding on to this, there's a good chance I'm going to be able to stand on my feet and not fall. And it's the same thing with us. If we lean on our own understanding, if we're not committed to completely leaning and trusting in God, we're going to fall. But if we lean on God, we're going to stand. We're going to be all right. We're going to be just fine. And notice that Solomon says, doesn't, he doesn't say, trust in the Lord with part of your heart. He doesn't say, trust in the Lord with some of your heart. All of your heart, a relationship with God demands your life, your soul, your all. You say, well, Pastor Mark, how can I do that? What does it look like for me and my kids to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts? It means to look to God in prayer and talk to him about whatever's on your heart and mind every single day. How do I know that? Psalm 55, verse 17 says, Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out to him in distress, and he hears my prayer. Well, Mark, I don't know what to say. And how do I teach my kids to pray? None of us are 100% sure what to say. This is what, where I like what Dr. Tom Young does in his high school class. He teaches his students to pray according to the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. A stands for adoration. Start out by saying, God, I adore you. I love you. I am so glad that I am part of your family. It is so reassuring that you are watching over me and you're watching over the world because there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world right now that I don't understand. But I'm so grateful for you. I adore you and I love you. And then the C in Acts is confession. God, I confess my sins. You know, me and my brother got into an argument at the pool the other day, and I pushed him into the pool. I, I shouldn't have done it. It was a dumb thing to do, and I apologize to you, and I apologize to my brother. And then the T in Acts is thanksgiving, because 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins, so we can say thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your blessings. And then S in Acts means supplication. That means asking God to supply certain needs. And that's what we usually do after the sermon, right? We ask God to supply the needs of people who are going through a hard time. We're going to be praying for Lori Krieger to be healed from ALS. We're going to be praying for Lori Neusart to be healed from cancer. We're going to be praying for Jason Richter to be healed from cancer. That's supplication, asking God to supply Needs. And when you do that, that's a great way to trust in the Lord with all your heart. And you can teach that to your kids at home. So by the time they get to Dr. Tom's, Tom's class, they'll already know it. And then Proverbs 3, 5 says, lean not on your own understanding. The problem is that we don't 
read the Bible, and so when you don't have the Word of God, you end up leaning on the words of men. You end up leaning on your own understanding rather than what God has written. And I see that a lot today with the LGBTQ issue. A lot of people say, well, love is love. So how can there be anything wrong with LGBTQ relationships? But when they say that, they're leaning on their own understanding. And I think it's so important in these complex times to see what God has said and lean on his understanding. And if God says in the Bible that LGBTQ practices are sinful, then how can we say love is love to something that God says is not love? How can we say, go ahead, this is love, when God says, don't go ahead, this is sin? How loving is it to tell people it's okay to do something that's going to hurt their relationship with God? Those are the types of things we got to think about. And faithful parents will point their kids to God. Now, having said that, I have to say this also. Your kids are not going to agree with everything you teach. I mean, I didn't agree with everything my parents taught when I was growing up. You know, you're responsible to be the best parent you can be before God, but you're not responsible for what your kids decide to choose for when they become adults. So just do the best you can and give it to the Lord and just pray that God will be glorified in it every single day and will accomplish his purposes. So, now that we know what faithful parents do, what does God want us to do? Number one, if you're not a Christian, receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, because the only way to be the best parent that you can be is by making sure that our Heavenly Father is your parent through faith in Jesus Christ. God is the greatest parent of them all. And when he is parenting you through the scriptures, through the word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's going to give you the wisdom to be the best parent you can be. You can't do this without God's help. Number two, if you're a parent, continue to make sure that you're in the picture loving on your kids, encouraging them, supporting them, praying for them. And number three, this is for the kids. I know you're not going to agree with everything your parents say and do. You've got your own, you've got your own life, and I, I get that. But I want you to pray for your mom and dad to be the best parents they can be. Just bring them before God. This is Father's Day. It's a good day to, even if you forget to do it this week, today's a good day to remember because it is Father's Day. Let's bring our parents before God. And if your parents have already gone into eternity, you can still honor your parents by being the best Christian you can be on earth, by being the kind of person that they're going to be proud of when you see them again in eternity. So it all starts with opening the door of your life to Jesus. And he's the one who transforms us into being the best parents we can. And in my case, the best pastor that I can be. Give your life to the one who gave his life for you. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen.
world of tears and snares. If I hold you, Lord, who cares? With me, my burden shares. None but thee, dear Lord, none but thee. give these joys and concerns to you. Thank you for being our Heavenly Father. Thank you for fathering and parenting us through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you that we are adopted into your family through faith in Jesus. And help us to teach our kids from the Bible what you're teaching us from the Bible. We want to pray for the people you put upon our hearts, for Lori Neusshart to be healed from cancer, for Lori Krieger's ALS to stop in its tracks and not go any further so she can live her full lifespan for your glory. For Natasha Partridge, for the surgery for her cancer, it sounds like things aren't going well. Help her to turn to you with all her heart and may she experience remission and healing in the name of Jesus. Help the surgeon do an awesome job. We pray for Brian's friend in the Philippines. She's studying to be a caregiver. We pray, God, for her schooling, that you would provide for all of her needs so that she can take care of her tuition and fulfill the calling that you have for her as a caregiver. We pray for a family member, for Renee, battling cancer and Lord I don't like to say that I hate this or I hate that but I hate cancer and I pray God that you would heal this person's cancer and we also pray for those who are traveling this Father's Day weekend and we pray for safety and security and vigilance on the roads we pray for our nation we thank you God that you reign from the throne of God in heaven and that brings great comfort when we don't always understand the politics and issues and troubles of our own day. We commit our nation to you. We also thank you, Lord, for those who are in ministries of caregiving. We think about social workers and counselors and doctors and physician assistants and nurse practitioners and EMTs and firefighters and paramedics, our law enforcement, our military, pastors and Sunday school instructors watch over them as they watch over us and most of all God we thank you for Jesus who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer saying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers come forward, we'll take up the morning offering. gifts and help us to use them wisely for ministry in Jesus name. Amen. Will the circle be unbroken?
And thank you for worshiping with, with us today. Happy Father's Day to all the dads. And I want to leave you with this word of blessing and encouragement. Peace to the brothers and sisters in love with faith from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. God bless you. Happy Father's Day, and go in peace. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of